Welcome to Beyond Disruption, where you'll learn how emerging tech is changing the world of accounting, business, and finance. Our guest experts break down the latest news in everything from blockchain to robotics, artificial intelligence to human intelligence. Tune in to find out how you can stay ahead of the curve. Hello, this is the Go Beyond Disruption podcast brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. From our UK office in the heart of the City of London, I'm Kyle Hannan. In this episode, Performance Management Nirvana, your roadmap to system sanity, we'll be talking about the importance of making the business case before you make the business decisions. We'll also be exploring how to get out of the Excel trap and how to take practical steps to help your team move from spreadsheets to systems. And of course, we say Excel, but other makes of spreadsheets are naturally available. And we'll be doing that with our expert guest, who's a longtime CMA and a consultant in enterprise performance management. He is Andy Carfax. Hello, Andy. Where are you joining us from today? Hi, Kyle. Um, I am in the heart of Paddington in London. So um, our head office um, for Lucanet UK is in Paddington. All right, so not too far from where we're sitting right now. So uh, we may be fairly close by, but our community of listeners is uh, very widely dispersed. And I'm certainly looking forward to sharing your experience and your insights with our community in their own parts of the world. So let's start with this. How does your work right now resonate with members of the accounting or finance professions? I think you jo- you join me now at my point in career where um, it's quite a landmark area for me because throughout my career I've been um, a consultant for the sort of big boy uh, enterprise performance management solutions you know dealing with clients like Paramount Pictures or Shell or you know big big cheeses um, and right now um, I've in the summer I took up a position with uh, Lucanet where we our speciality is group consolidation software. Um, and it's it's not so much for the big boys, so so it's more for the mid tier market where I find that uh, there's there's a whole host of um, accountants and SEMA professionals that are basically struggling uh, to to do what they need to do, mainly using Excel. So you sound like exactly the right person to be talking about how to move beyond spreadsheets, and you've been writing about this too. In fact, you've um, been the author of white papers like report visualization uh, from concept to deployment, as well as one called from spreadsheets to systems. And you particularly, um, because of your background as a, a, a CMA, you've been qualified for about two decades, as I, as I understand it. And I'm only 28 as well. Yeah. So you, you certainly understand <laughs> where our audience and your peers and your clients are moving from, but you've also got a very firm idea of where they could be moving to. So that's all about uh, making reporting better, um, operational planning, business intelligence. And that, I think, especially connects with our topic today. So let's look at some of the people you were working with and some of those, those companies. What was the biggest challenge that you've seen working in the mid-market with, with finance colleagues? We would kind of refer to the the challenges as the Excel trap or you know death by spreadsheet. You know the, these are terms that will resonate with our colleagues. Um, and basically, it, it it means you're in a situation where you spend longer producing the information than you do analysing. And if you hark back to our training, it's the, the whole point of an accountant, in certainly a chartered management accountant, is that we use our knowledge and experience, and not just produce the data, but we're looking at it and we're trying to influence business decisions. Now, if we're spending all of our time basically producing the data, then we're not spending that time um, influencing business decisions and really not adding value. I know that we use the word Excel to, to talk about what spreadsheets as a whole can lock us into. Um, you've said we spend longer producing than analyzing. And you've also talked about the misconceptions that this takes time and it takes money. And you've also touched on how the CFOs tend to find themselves making a big mistake. What is that? What has your experience actually put your finger on that you think more people need to know about from the, from the CFO level? Yeah, I mean, at the CFO level, I'd say there's, there's, 
there's a, there's a massive mistake that certainly my experience and, and dealing with CFOs at all levels from small to large is that we concentrate on the glamorous end of finance. So the next big thing that's around the corner, like, you know, artificial intelligence or big data, you know, it read something in the FT that says, oh, actually, let's let's replace the whole of our our, our value wasting, you know, finance team with a whole host of robots. And that must be more efficient because it says so in the FT. So, I mean, I think whilst all of this like new technology is glamorous and, and, you know, really exciting, some of the stuff that's coming out, I think the biggest mistake at CFO level is actually not focusing on, you know, the boring stuff, the, the, the stuff that their guys, you know, the 20, 30, 10, however many people in the finance team are getting frustrated with on day to day. And it's basically causing them to be inefficient. Here at the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants, of course, we keep an eye on what is around the corner. And change is always with us. I mean, disruption isn't a new thing. So in the context of the work you've done, especially with the clients you've had and working with the finance professionals you've been um, assisting, what was the last big disruption that you, you saw in the profession? Because you've talked about people looking ahead. But let's look back. What happened to those that didn't adapt in the past? How did it change the organizations that you were working with, either for better or for worse? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you raise a really valid point. It's, you can't ignore what's going on in, in the future, um, or even just around the corner, or even what's present in the current trend. But, you, you know, actually focusing on that and, and not looking at actually what's available now is, is, is a is an issue now what is available now and what has been a major disruptor um in the last few years is is what we refer to as the cloud so the cloud in simple terms can be okay i'm hosting my solution up into um you know uh, somebody else's server in the cloud you know if it's google it's probably under the sea in a big container but actually the cloud in itself um, is a disruptor, but that's not what we should be interested in. So things like the cloud, it, it enables things like SaaS um, products, so software as a service. You know, software as a service, thoroughly enabled by cloud, enables most of the, our colleagues that we're working with to actually have access to systems that they wouldn't have been able to access five years ago. So five, ten years ago, you'd be looking at multi-million pound investments to try and improve um, you know, the the reporting that we're doing at the moment using Excel, whereas now with products that are widely available um, via SaaS and, you, you know, you don't need to think about a big server room. You don't need to think often now about actually I need some coders that are going to come and build something. You know, S cloud enabled SaaS and SaaS has enabled a load of new products that are very user user ready, really intuitive for a finance user, not an IT user, um, and that's really what's what's been the most exciting thing for me in the last few years. Um, is that all of these products have come to the market? They're giving options for CFOs and FDs to say, "Well, actually, let's look at this." And I use the phrase, "The niche has become the norm." So five years ago, these products were quite niche products. But now it's quite normal for companies of any size to be looking at these products and thinking, actually, that little product there, that does that particular business requirement really well. I'm going to think about investing in that. And I don't have to go wall to wall, SAP, Oracle, IBM. This is where systems become so important. And when you saw this change happening, this disruption, did you see problems caused when this formality, which would normally be required by an IT professional, didn't translate from one to the other effectively. You've hit the nail on the head twice there, really, because the first thing um, which you mentioned is there's a little bit of a transfer of power from the CIO to CFO. Um, and, you know, these guys are people at the end of the day. So we're talking about, oh, do I want that transfer to go? Do I, you know, CIO is thinking, do I want the CFO to actually be in charge of their own development and their own systems? Because, you know, they, they haven't got that, um, say, that, that discipline around project implementation. I mean, most finance um, professionals, if you want to build a spreadsheet, 
you open up Excel or other, as you said, um, and then you build the spreadsheet and you start using it. So if you translate the spreadsheet to a system, you know, you wouldn't do that. You'd, you'd think about what you want, you know, in, in system speak, we'd look at the requirements, we'd look at technical requirements, we'd look at functional requirements. We'd then build a design around that. We'd build it, we'd test it. We'd make sure it was, um, able to be supported afterwards. And these are the kind of disciplines that, um, yeah, you know, projects run out of IT would come as a, as, as as a matter of course. You know, if you look at Prince Two, or or the other you know, PMPs, the other ways of uh, managing projects, these are things that you know add the formality, that bring control to a, a project. That maybe that kind of skill is is lacking in the finance world. So as we look at how the finance professional may be taking on many of the responsibilities of uh, an information professional. How do we get around that? How do we avoid replicating these downsides of Excel and other spreadsheets, of course? Um, What is the first thing that a finance professional needs to do differently? It's not just a professional in in their own right as well. It's it's actually the, you know, the organisational structure of a finance team might change. So I'll give you an example. I, I, I used to work for KPMG and we would advise companies on um, how best to run uh, the finance team. And we'd say, OK, normally in our experience, you have X number of people on, you know, I don't know, sales ledger, X number on purchase ledger, all the way through to, to group reporting. Um, when we would work with companies who are implementing software in, in you know, agile solutions that are easy to use, our recommendation most times would be to create something like a, what we'd call a center of excellence. Um, and this could be a, a center of excellence in a formal, bring a load of people out of teams and into a, a, another team that becomes in the center, or it might be an informal center of excellence. So, for example, you have in each team that are using the new system, you have people that become you know super users, superheroes, Um, And they get advanced training. And part of that training is not just training in the software, but it's training as to how to go through that project lifecycle. So so how to understand really, you know, the link and the traceability from requirements through to delivery. And when you've got that more formal approach, because, of course, you're the expert, I'm not, that to me doesn't sound very nimble, doesn't sound very agile, does it? That's interesting. Agile is, you know, it's one of those buzzwords. I mean, ad- agile development effectively has to be controlled as well. So I like to call, you know, if I implement with a client that's an, it, calling it agile, I like to call it a controlled agile development. Because you still go through those stages of the life cycle. It's just you go through them in small sprints. Um, so bite-sized chunks. So instead of looking at the whole requirement, okay, we're going to do the um, I don't know, the input sheets first in this week or next week. So you go through that, you look at what you need, you 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 design them, you test them, you you get them ready for rolling out. And then the next week, you might have another sprint that says, okay, I'm going to look at reports. And another sprint might be calcs. Um, effectively, Agile just enables you to um, split that whole project up into little sprints that that have many benefits and most most of the benefits are that you can um, see see what's happening more quickly rather than waiting to the end you can make changes at various points so you don't go and develop the whole piece um, you know going one way and then suddenly realize ah, I made a mistake right at the start um, and they also have motivational benefits because you can start delivering real tangible benefits um, at each of those sprints rather than just waiting for the you know, the end of the project. So uh, many, many times in, in my experience where long projects have, uh, you know, we've been involved in, you get project fatigue and you get people sort of getting tired at the end of the project. Agile gives you that ability to, you know, deliver, deliver, deliver quickly, um, which is motivational. Well, variety is the spice of life. Talking about this performance management nirvana, which we're using in the title of this podcast. Let's look at some practical steps to see how our listeners and people in the finance profession can deliver that 
now, today? What are some practical steps that you'd recommend that would help the affected sectors of our profession turn these current changes into opportunities? What are some common things you think they may be overlooking which you can help them actually get a handle on? Yeah, and of course, I guess the common, most common mistake and the easiest thing to do is actually to do nothing. Um, you know, the, the, our, our accountants out working in, in industry are, are leaders and, and sometimes a bit of leadership is to actually just, you know, to go outside of your comfort zone and start looking at this. Um, because unless you've done systems implementations like this, even if they're small, agile ones, unless you've done them in the past, um, you know, you're, you're, you're really sort of, you're operating slightly outside of your comfort zone. Now, I mean, at that point, I'd say, you know, use your network, talk to others. Everybody is similar. Um, over the years, most, most customers I've worked with, you start off working with them and do the, you know, the initial requirements or the scoping. And, and the common phrase is, yeah, we're a little bit different around here. And actually, nobody's different. So, you know, talk through with your network. It's not admitting, it's not admitting failure. Say, you know, I, I have this issues. What, what do you do around that? Have you thought about this? Um, you know, it's, it, it's, everybody is generally in the same boat. Um, there's so much information available on the internet. Of course, you can get swamped by it. But as a first point, I would say, just have a think about, you know, how can we do something better? Where are our where are our major pain points? And then uh, hit Google or hit your network. And, and talk to others in a, a similar position. That, that makes very, very good sense. Now, we'll be talking about your phrase, the niche becomes the norm. We'll be doing that in a minute. But while we're on the subject of talking to others. Are you ready for disruption? Join us in Chicago, Illinois, April 24th through 26th at the AICPA CFO Conference to find out. The CFO Conference keeps you at the cutting edge of the financial industry with 22 sessions developed for CFOs, by CFOs, 33 subject matter experts, and two professional networking sessions. It's the one event of the year specifically designed to prepare you for disruption and provide you with the opportunities to advance your career and make your mark in the C-suite world. Get $75 off when you register before March 12th and use promo code CFO19 for an extra 75 off for a total savings of $150. But don't worry, if you're hearing this podcast after March 12th, you can still use promo code CFO19. And if you can't attend the CFO conference in person, you can still join us online so you don't miss out with all of our exclusive sessions streamed live in real time straight to your computer or mobile device. You'll also have access to remote networking, chat rooms, handouts, and slides, just as if you're there with us on site. Register today at AICPAstore.com slash CFO, and we'll look forward to seeing you at the 2019 CFO Conference. All right, let's pick up that conversation about performance management nirvana. We're talking to Andy Carfax. Andy, uh, we've mentioned this a couple of times. You use this phrase, the niche becomes the norm. Tell us a bit more about that. Mm. I'm thinking about getting this tattooed, actually. I quite, I quite like it. But, I mean, I've, I, you, you mentioned at the start, I've been uh, a CMA for 20 years. Um, and pretty much most, most of that time, I've been, whether... It was before consulting or user of uh, finance systems. And if I go back to, you know, 15 years ago, effectively there were two vendors in the, in the performance management space. And that performance management space has been called enterprise performance management, corporate performance management, business performance management, financial performance management. Um, it's had many badges, but effectively um, we're talking about systems that help you with planning, with reporting, with group consolidated reporting, with disclosure management. That's really um, performance management with any other flavor. So you say 10 years ago, there were two vendors and effectively you, you as a CFO would go one way or the other way. Um, and either way would be fine and either way had strengths in one area, strengths in, or the other one would have strengths in a different area. So you'd get yeah, it always used to be the case where we used to say, okay, Hyperion was very strong on consolidation, whereas maybe Cognos was a bit more flexible on budgeting and planning. And the phrase nobody ever got fired for IBM was, you know, is, is in everybody's mind. And because these are big implementations generally. 
And what we've seen over the years as as the market has evolved, and say that cloud was the the enabler, um, is there's many more um, vendors on on the market now, and those vendors are are taking those specialities and saying, right, for example, you know, consolidated reporting is is what my company does. We only we don't only do that. We do planning and we do um, disclosure management and other stuff. But our core is really around consolidated reporting. Um, and there's other companies that would have calls around, say, planning and operational planning. Now, what we're seeing now is the market has evolved and the cloud has allowed companies like ourselves to come to the market um, with a lower price point. Um, is at the start, it was it was almost like niches. So you get a few companies that say, oh, we'll give it a go. We've got some money. But actually now, as, that, as, as the momentum has improved and and the ability to make these products really enterprise ready, but still at that niche um, performance category, um, we, we find that it's, it's not no longer the odd company that are saying, okay, we'll take a punt on this company. It's big organizations that are saying, actually, I like the functionality of that niche. And I look at it and it's much actually much stronger in that particular area than you know the historic big boys who are basically very strong on all areas. So it's good for companies like myself, but it's 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 a changing environment. You you basically in ten years ago you'd have one vendor, and you'd have one vendor relationship. And now what we're seeing in the market is most companies will have vent relationships with multiple vendors. And that means it's not just for the big corporate players, even though they may be leading the way. Uh, these niche vendors, every time they find success, it means that, very much like that phrase, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. It means there are benefits in the mid-market too. So let's get ahead of that curve and look at what's coming up. The next disruption, what's one big change that you think lies ahead from your perspective? And how do you recommend we get ready for it, either as perhaps one of those large corporates you were talking about, perhaps someone who's more mid-market. Perhaps this even applies to a sole practitioner. What do you think they need to be aware of that you see as just around the corner? So the, the early uh, the early vendors that were what we call niche products um, still had a bit of legacy um, implementation effort associated with them. So you still needed a little bit of coding. Um, now what what many products are doing certainly our product is doing is that you can implement the system without knowing any coding whatsoever so it's more configuration rather than customization now that that's something that actually a lot of people i talk to even in the mid-market even like you say the sole practitioners they're not aware of that so it's an awareness issue mainly is that you you don't need that level of uh, coding in in the systems implementation so you know what actually you thought was not possible five years ago um is possible now so i mean the, the th- this this level of sort of i call it dumbing down coding it is configuration it's not customization it's have a look at the softwares because the software products out there will give you a functionality and it's really up to you to configure that functionality to to match your requirements now sometimes that might mean that you you change your process a little bit and that might be a good thing because basically um money and effort and time into what's the best practice in that solution will have been put into that product so you know you can use the products now to help drive that best practice within your organization rather than say okay right start from scratch what do i need to build what do i need to what should be my best practices now the 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 actual best practice is within that solution so i'll give you an example um when we implement um ifos reporting with our with our clients we have a starter kit that's effectively it's it's the schedules that you need to complete your ifos year-end accounting return um they're there you don't need to build them from scratch so whereas now you're thinking, okay, well, actually, I can just configure those. I can adjust them where I want to make a few slight tweaks rather than five, ten years ago where you said, right, okay, what does my IFRS balance sheet look like? Right, I need to build this. 
now um, it's actually in the software so the thing that's really uh, the right time is now to actually to do something because the solutions are there that can help guide you and give you that best practice and you're not paying for it or paying for a team of consultants to tell you what best practice is. And talking of these best practices, you were saying that there's a lot that the organisation can do because the solutions may seem closer at hand than they realise. And I'm going to just go back to something you were talking about earlier. Perhaps this isn't something that many organisations are aware that they can do fairly easily. You talked about setting up resource centres of excellence within those organisations. What is a practical way of doing that? I mean, of course, a centre of excellence, if you've got five people in the finance team, it might be one person or it might be two people. Um, but it's, it's, and certainly you'd never go for one because just in case the uh, proverbial bus rut ran them over, you'd need a second. So it could be two people, but what you need to do is think about, okay, have I got the right people in in, in, in that centre of excellence and what is the right person? So the right person is that is that finance person with a little bit of IT. So it's a little bit of, um, you know, structured project development, testing development, that kind of stuff, um, but that understands the finance business problem as well. You work with and sometimes take on people who are at this kind of, this inflection point between being finance professionals, but also being able to deliver value within the IT side of things. So looking at actually uses people who are accountants i used to run um hyperion consolidation teams yeah. and when i'd recruit for these guys i'd be recruiting for you know a visual basic uh programmer that knew finance um now when i recruit for lucanet i just want accountants i want people that know the finance process from a group consolidation perspective but also can do that with a level of you know it professionality around them a finance professional can do much more than work within the finance profession because they probably are more ready to provide value in the IT context than they realise. But you've really got to understand the finance problem too. So, you know, what am I trying to do? What's my end goal? But when we implement with customers, the, the first, um, you know, the, the, the first thing we do is we identify people who uh, could fit the mould to develop it because we don't want to develop... Um, a solution and just hand it over to someone we don't deliver to we deliver with now and and that's been a change in in software over the years whereas you couldn't do that before because it would mean training your finance guys up on on you know visual basic or c plus or any other coding language now the training within finance is is much um less technical but it's more around those those skills around how do i you know how do I form, formalize the development of uh, a system or even you could apply it to a spreadsheet? And for someone who wants to find out more about moving to this system sanity, this performance management nirvana, moving from spreadsheets to systems themselves, how would they find out more about the topic in general, about your work in particular? What's a good place to start? The best place for, for anyone is, is, as we mentioned before, use your network. Um, and that network's not just um, the people in you know, similar roles to you. It's you know, the association is, 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 like you mentioned earlier, it's got a wealth of knowledge and these podcasts and other articles um, and, and the regional events as well. If you don't open yourself up to this information, you'll never get there, will you? So the information is out there. Even, even you know, Google is an information hunter. So software companies like myself are paying Google to basically produce our results and our company names when you search on the right topics. So you know, it's not in my interest to have you search for something that's completely irrelevant that you come through because we won't be able to help you. So you know, Google, just as, a, as an information center, is, is amazing. You just need to make sure you're searching for the right business problems. And I guarantee people like myself are paying the, the money to make sure you get our hits when you, when you search. What should they specifically look for online? Where should they go? 
There's lots of the, the buzzwords that we talked about earlier, like performance management, whether it was enterprise, corporate, business. All that. If, we, if we take away the buzzword and say, okay, is my business problem that I can't plan? Is it that budgeting and planning is a problem? So if, it, if that's your problem, then you know, Google budgeting and planning or budgeting systems or planning systems. You know, you'll get through to the right place. Um, as, as we mentioned earlier, I mean, the, the, the wealth of information on the association, um, that would be my first point to look at. What I wouldn't look at is anyone that's basically got an interest in taking you down another route. You know, there's lots of independent articles written and really are they independent? So you've got to be careful. Um, you know, everybody's trying to sell you something, including me. So, um, you know, be, be careful. This is why I'd say use your network, talk to people you trust, find out what they're doing, um, and then maybe use the, the, the SEMA website or the AICPA website because that, that's a truly independent place. Nobody's trying to sell you anything there. So look for the portals rather than the pitches. Talk to your yes. networks. Think of the problem you're trying to solve and start with that rather than trying to use a buzzword you heard someone mention. And remember that there's nothing better, as you say, than people coming from that context or in the same position that have been through the same journey. You know, start with them, ask the questions. So I, I think that's a great way to wrap up. But before we do, what's one message that you'd like to leave for accounting and finance professionals that will help them go beyond this disruption? The worst thing you can do is don't do anything. Um, don't fear the change. Just It's just like having a baby. There is never a good time to have a baby. You know, I'd just say in summary, be bold and brave because you'll, you'll learn so much more uh, doing something new tomorrow than you will by replicating what you did yesterday. Andy Carfax, thank you so much. And as we've been hearing from Andy, there's lots more to explore around the topic of moving from spreadsheets to a, a more system-based approach. We'll make sure that the show notes include links to all the resources that he's mentioned, including links to our website and to his as well. Uh, there are two websites that we'd recommend for anyone interested in taking uh, perhaps any learning opportunities in this context. Now, most of our members will already be using one or the other of these websites. So depending on where you are in the world, you may already have these websites in your bookmarks. So if you're already using AICPAstore.com, you can go to AICPAstore.com slash go beyond disruption. Or if you're on the CGMA store, then go to cgmastore.com slash go beyond disruption. That's where you'll find courses, webinars, and more professional development resources, which are constantly updated to keep you ahead of the curve. And for exclusive insights and perspectives every week right here on a podcast, you can get our latest episodes wherever you already get your podcasts or your music. So that's Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts. We're on iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, even TuneIn Radio. It's free, totally automatic. All you have to do is tap subscribe or follow. And you can also just search online for Go Beyond Disruption podcast. Uh, you can use Bing, Google, use your smart speakers. Uh, you'll find us pretty easily. It's all about the right words, as Andy was saying. Uh, we hope you got something useful from this episode. And if you did, whether you're already an established listener or if you've just discovered us for the first time, why not go ahead and share it with someone else in your network who'd enjoy it too? I'm Kyle Hannan. We'll be back soon with more insights that help you and the profession to go beyond disruption. Until next time, goodbye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond Disruption, brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Learn more about today's topic at AICPA-CIMA.com forward slash disruption. This podcast is designed to provide illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the AICPA or AICPA.org. It is provided with the understanding that the AICPA and AICPA.org are not engaged in offering legal, accounting, or other professional service. If such advice or expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional person should be sought. The AICPA and AICPA.org make no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to, and assume no responsibility for, the content or application of the material contained herein.
and especially disclaim all liability for any damages arising out of the use of, reference to, or reliance on such material. Such material. Such material.